you're ready to praise and worship the Lord tonight? Has God been faithful to you this week? Are you still saved tonight? I know He's keeping me. I know He's keeping you too. Thank you. 
Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you this day. Just to thank you and praise you, Lord, once again for seeing us to the midpoint of this week, Lord. Father, we know we've gone through trials and temptations, but Lord, you've seen us through each and every one, Father. We've come out unscathed. And it's all because of your mercy, your grace, and your love, Father. We thank you and we praise you for your protection. We thank you, Lord, for blessed salvation. We thank you, Lord, for just everything that you do and everything that you are. And Father, tonight as we have gathered here in your house to worship you and to praise you, Father, we ask now, Lord, that you would open our spiritual ears and our spiritual eyes and let our hearts be open to your word, Father. Let that word speak life into us. That life, let it take root in our hearts and let it begin to produce the fruit that you desire of your children, Lord. For we know that you're coming back soon. And we know that we have to be prepared and ready for that, Lord. And so we just ask as we hear this word, let it prepare us for your return. But at, at this point in time, Lord, we just ask also that you help us in preparation for what you want to continue to do here on this earth as you tarry. And that is to be all about the lost. We thank you. We praise you for what you're going to do with Brother Lucas as he brings the message. And above all, to make each and everything we say and do bring glory and honor and praise unto you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. All God's children say, Amen. 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 Individually, 
in our walk with you tonight. We just ask you, Holy Spirit, to speak to us. Give us ears to hear your word and your voice tonight, God. We believe that as we get into the Bible, you said that your word will never return void, but it will accomplish what you set it forth to do. So, God, we are just bringing ourselves before you, and we ask that your word would take root in our hearts tonight, God. That we would receive it and be changed by it and transformed as we come closer to you, Jesus. We thank you for what you're going to do. I just ask you for your help tonight, and I give you praise, honor, and glory. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So it says in Matthew 14 and 22, And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side, while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with the waves, for the wind was contrary. It was blowing against it. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit or a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be you, bid me to come unto you on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, strong, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. <clears throat> and immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand. And he caught him and said unto him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they were come into the ship, the wind ceased. It stopped. So tonight we're starting out talking about our good friend, Peter. Peter is you and me at different moments of our lives. He's the disciple who in moments has great and mighty faith. But he's the same disciple in the very next moment that Jesus says, Get behind me, Satan. You don't understand the things of God. Peter is the one who Jesus set as one of the leaders of the New Testament church. Uh, Jesus said, on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And what he was talking about is, Peter, you said I was the son of God, and I'm going to build the whole ministry, the whole gospel, the whole church on the revelation that I, Jesus, am the son of God that came to die on a cross and give his life for the sins of the world. But in this moment of Peter's life, he's in the midst of the sea with all of his fellow disciples. And don't you think it's interesting in life that a lot of times the seas don't start raging until Jesus is nowhere to be found in your life? Jesus steps out and stays back to pray, and the disciples get out in this boat in the middle of the water, and most of these guys are fishermen. They know how to handle the sea. They know what they're doing. But they got in these waves and this wind, and they were all worried and afraid and the winds were blowing against them and their command was let's get to the other side but they found that God I'm having trouble keeping your command because all of this stuff is raging against me do you ever feel like when God asks you to do something then a bunch of stuff starts happening to make that thing God asks you to do seem difficult to reach it's like your life descends into chaos and turmoil Right after God just gave you a mountaintop vision or promise that you're supposed to hold on to and carry. So in this moment, these disciples are 
in the sea and the waves are crashing and tossing them around. And they see something walking out on the water. <coughs> and I never understood why they cried out, it's a ghost, until I watched that show, The Chosen. If any of you have seen The Chosen, the very last episode is Jesus walking on the water. And I was always thinking, God, why did they think you were a ghost? Were these people like into horror movies and stuff and they see ghosts? What? Why? And in the, the Chosen video, it basically shows lightning crashing. And when it's dark and then there's a spot of lightning, you can see like a shadow of something off in the distance. So they see the silhouette of this man or some kind of form coming toward them as they're fighting these waves and they cry out, it's a ghost. And here Peter in this moment sees the ghost just like the rest of them. And Jesus identifies himself. You will know people by their voice. Isn't it interesting how when you answer the phone sometimes you hear somebody speak and you don't know who it is, but when you hear their voice, oh, I know who you are. Hey, Mom, how's it going? Hey, Dad. Hey, friend. Hey, brother. You will know the Spirit of God by His voice. Because when God speaks, He don't speak like anybody else. The devil always talks really, really loud. Have you noticed that? Your flesh oftentimes talks really, really loud. But the Lord always seems to speak in that still, small voice that you really got to listen to and let your heart be quieted before. But in this moment, Jesus cries out and says, I'm here. Don't be afraid. It's me. And Peter has a bright idea. He says, if it's really Jesus, every time I'm around him, he does stuff that nobody else can do. So I'm going to ask him, if it's you, Jesus, let me walk out on this water. Now, raise your hand if people are supposed to be able to walk on water. They're not. Have you ever tried? I have. It doesn't work. <laughs> You can pray in tongues all you want, but when you step out on that water, you're going to sink down to the bottom. <laughs> See, the key thing about walking on water in this moment was that Jesus was identifying himself to Peter. It's really me, and I'm getting ready to show you who I really am. And so it says in verse 29 that Peter came down out of the ship, and he walked on the water. But this is the key phrase, to go to Jesus. There are going to be a lot of times, and there have been a lot of times in your life, where you've needed to get to Jesus, but it just feels like there is no way I'm getting to him. But then somehow it's almost like God picks you up and he carries you right into his presence. And in this moment right here, Peter was given the supernatural ability to walk on the water as he went to Jesus. But verse 30 is where most of us find ourselves in life. While we're walking in the will of God. But when Peter saw the wind. That it was boisterous. He got afraid. And he began to sink. Have you all ever sank? As you started looking at the wind. And start, stopped looking at God. Have you ever got distracted by. What's going on in your family? What's going on in this world? All the chaos that surrounds just living on earth. And we have got more noise now than anybody has ever had in the history of the world. It, it's, it's hard to get in a quiet place anymore. Because as soon as you get in that quiet place, it's almost like sometimes your mind just runs like a mouse on a wheel. Just running, 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 running. And I, and I think, man, when it's hard to get quiet, it's hard to hear God's voice. Because you got to be able to get quiet because he's not going, hey, it's me, I'm God, I'm here. He's that still, small voice that speaks to you. But as Peter saw the wind, as you and I often see the wind around us, it causes us to get our focus off of Jesus. So what I believe God wanted me to just start out by saying tonight <coughs> is it is key in 2023 for you and for me to learn how to really have tunnel vision. You see, Peter, I believe, started seeing the wind around him. You know, Jesus is standing in front of him. He's walking toward Jesus. And I think he looked down at his feet and he saw the waves bouncing up and thought, wow, 
walking on water. Then he started looking around and he saw the sea was raging all around him and he saw the wind. The funny thing about seeing the wind is, name the last time you saw wind. You can't see wind. I just blew some wind on it. Did you, did you see it? <laughs> COVID, I would not. Y'all would have kicked me out of this COVID. <laughs> But you can't see wind. All you can see is the effects of the wind. So in this moment, Peter is saying, I'm seeing something that's not there. I just see the effects of it. But he does a thing. He looks around, and the Bible says he began to sink. He began to sink. And I wonder tonight if there are people in our church, and there are people in our community, and there are people in the house of faith in Smith County, Washington County, Virginia, Tennessee, West Virginia, Kentucky, and all of the United States that are Christians that love God, but they're beginning to sink because the weight of the world and the weight of their problems are overwhelming them to the point to where they're not seeing Jesus anymore. And that's a scary place to be because when you can't see Jesus, you can't see hope. You can't see a way out. You can't see a future. But it says Peter did the only thing he knew to do. He cried out, Lord, save me. Have you all ever cried that out? Not just when you got saved, but as you've been walking with God. Have you ever, Lord, save me, please. Sometimes I say, God, save me from myself. You want to talk about the... You hear, you hear the wind? <laughs> Let me switch. Trying to be unpredictable so people won't get bored with me. <laughs> but you notice how I can I know I'm only 31, and many of you are double my age, but I tell you it is easy to get your eyes off of Jesus and come to church every time the doors are open. It's easy to pray for 30 minutes to an hour in the morning. And then leave and an hour later forget everything that you talk to God about. It's easy to pray a prayer and give something to Jesus. And then as soon as you get up from the altar, pick it back up and carry it home with you. It's easy to come and get prayed for and then find yourself doubting and saying, oh, I don't know if it's going to happen for me. And in this moment, Peter is feeling the fear of I am sinking in a big mess of wind and waves. And he cries out, Lord, save me. And this is what I want you to think about tonight in this message. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him. So you've got to see this picture of Peter struggling and going under the water. And with his last breath, he cries, Lord, save me. And Jesus steps out and catches him. <coughs> Man, I, I've been there in my life. I know I was there when I was lost, and I got to this place where I was like, I have no hope. I'm 19 years old, and I have no hope, and if this is all there is to life, it just really stinks. I don't like, I don't like living. I don't like how my life has turned out, and I'm only 19. And in that moment, I was feeling like I was sinking. I was like, Lord, I don't know how to relate to people. Lord, I I just feel all alone. Right? I didn't want to pray the Lord. I was just saying to myself, I feel all alone. Did you ever feel all alone when you were lost? Did you ever feel all alone when you were saved? Probably some of you have. But I didn't know what else to do but to say, you know, my mom really gets on my nerves, but she really seems to like this Jesus she talks about. Man, I... She used to play this guy called the Donut Man in the car when I was a little boy. I don't know if you remember the Donut Man, but he was he would sing all of these songs about the walls of Jericho and maybe Daniel and the Lions Den and other things. And she would play all that stuff. And so here I am, a boy growing up, wanting to hear ACDC, wanting to hear some Leonard Skinner, wanting to hear some good sinner stuff because I was a sinner. And my mom was playing the Donut Man and Carmen and Mercy Me and Sela, and I'm like. Wait to get out of this car. And then she she dragged me to church every Sunday. And I made sure to come in with a grumpy face every time. Just to let everybody know I hate it here. I don't want to be here. 
And it's like I finally slowly got to this place of just sinking deeper and deeper into, man, I'm all alone and I don't like who I am and I don't like my life. And I, I know in that moment that Jesus reached out and he grabbed me up. And I wasn't quite like Peter in this moment. I was more like the prodigal that said, man, I'm really hungry. And the only place I know to go is where mama goes because there must be something to eat in there. And I didn't come running and saying, I repent. I repent, Father. I'm so sorry. I came like the prodigal with a hungry stomach. And Jesus still reached out. Jesus still pulled up his robe and came running to greet me. And what I've seen in that moment is what I see in all the moments of my life since then. Just because you get saved don't mean you don't need to be saved by Jesus every day. Jesus wasn't just my Savior in February of 2019. He's my Savior every single day because I need him every day to be my Savior. And in that moment with Peter, he stretches forth his hand and he catches Peter. He catches Peter. And I want to tell you tonight, you are never out of Jesus' reach if you're calling on his name. I know they talk about the unpardonable sin that says, you know, if you blaspheme the Holy Ghost, he will have, God will have nothing to do with you. If you're calling on the name of Jesus, you haven't committed the unpardonable sin because the Spirit's still drawing you to Jesus. But what Jesus does is he reaches out to you in some moments of your life. And he picks you up and he helps you and he carries you. I, I actually titled this sermon tonight, Reach. I just want you to get that picture of reach as Jesus was reaching out to grab Peter as he was sinking. So I'm going to read a couple of scriptures and kind of set a, a context for this tonight. But I'm going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. I mentioned this uh, last Wednesday. It says, But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Somebody say tonight, I've got my eyes on Jesus. I've got tunnel vision. That's what we need to know. If you can do anything in 2023, guard what comes in here in your ears. Guard what you let in your head. But number three, get you some tunnel vision. Because sometimes you don't need to see what's going on around you because it will just mess you up. I need tunnel vision. That's why the Bible says the word of God is like a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. You notice it doesn't say it's a light to Amber's path or it's a light to um, this brother's path or a light to Shane's path. It says it's a light unto my path. So what God is saying to you is that you've got to have tunnel vision for your purpose. You've got to have tunnel vision to see what he wants to do with your life. Because all of our paths go toward the Lord. They go toward his will for our lives. But they all look a little bit different. We come from a different background. We have different personalities. We have different giftings. So what God wants you to have and wants me to have is a little bit of tunnel vision so that when the wind and the waves are raging, when Fox News is saying bad things are coming, when the market's crashing, when the banks are failing, that I'm turning to Jesus. I know on Monday, uh, my, my boss came in and we usually have Monday morning meetings just to talk about where we are in our department and how things are going. So I thought that's what we were going to talk about on Monday. But he came in and he was plum scared to death about those two banks that failed out there in California than the one that failed in um, New York. And he said, guys, I might be crying wolf and I might just be worried, but this has got me shooken up like we're about to go into 08 again. And, you know, me and the other lady that work in the department, we're both Christians. So we were both like, we're not really worried at all. If the bank crashes, if, if I lose my salary... I know I still have a God who can take care of me outside of my salary. If, if the world comes crashing down, our world doesn't have to come crashing down because we've got the Spirit of God living on the inside of us. 
Sometimes it's got to get a little darker outside so that people can see the light that shines inside of us. But you have to have a little bit of tunnel vision to walk this earth. But Jesus says in, in his word, or Paul says through the spirit of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, we all with open face behold as in a glass the glory of the Lord. And as we behold the glory of the Lord, we are changed into that same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. As I get my eyes on Jesus, a lot of times I'm able to do things and overcome things that I never could overcome by myself. The Bible says in John 14 and 12, Jesus speaking, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believes on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go to my Father. Does anyone in this room believe on Jesus tonight? Amen. Jesus says the works that he did, you will do also in greater works, because he goes to his Father. But you've got to have your eyes on Jesus. You've got to be able to look toward Jesus when everything else is falling apart. Peter only sank when he started looking at everything around him and stopped looking at Jesus. So tonight I am asking you to reach. I'm going to give you another passage of scripture. and Go ahead and turn here if you've got your Bible. It's Matthew chapter 12, verse 9 through 13. Matthew chapter 12, verse 9 through 13. So we see Jesus reaching out and catching Peter. But I want to show you another situation and encounter with Jesus. So chapter 12, verse 9. And it says in verse 9, And when he was departed thence, he went into their synagogue, and behold, there was a man which had his hand withered. And they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath days that they might accuse him? Could you imagine being around a group of people who didn't want somebody to be healed because it was a Sabbath day? Sure, I can't imagine that. And it says in verse 11, And he said unto them, What man shall there be among you that shall have one sheep and if it fall into a pit on the Sabbath day, will he not lay hold on it and lift it out? How much then is a man better than a sheep? Wherefore, it is lawful to do well on the Sabbath days. So, just keep in mind verse um, 10. Jesus sees a man that has his hand withered, it says. It goes on to say in verse 13, Then Jesus said unto the man, Stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it forth, and it was restored whole, like as the other. So in this case, Jesus doesn't say, I'm going to stretch out and touch you. He asked this man to stretch forth his hand to Jesus. But the problem in this situation is, this man's got a withered hand. And what is a withered hand to you and to me? It's something I'm not real proud of. It's something I don't really want to share. But what Jesus does is he tells this man with this withered hand to stretch out his infirmity and let everybody see it. That's an uncomfortable place to be for this man. Lord, I don't, I can't stretch my hand out here. Everybody's going to see I'm, I'm a freak. Everybody's going to see that. I'm imperfect, that I'm messed up, that I don't have it all together. I can't do it. And in that moment, Jesus says, I want you to stretch it out because I want everybody to see what I'm about to do for you. Now, when you think about a withered hand, I think in order to understand the Bible in a better way, you have to understand what hands do. Why is it important for this man to not have a withered hand? What do hands do? Hands hold things, don't they? If you have a withered hand, you can't pick things up like you can with your hand that's not withered. So what this man had was an infirmity that caused him to have a lack of ability to hold things. Why does that happen? Well, a lot of things done physically in the Bible have a spiritual context for you and for me. 
So there might be some people in this room tonight that you don't have a withered hand, but you've got a, a withered heart. You don't have a withered hand, but you've got something in your life that caused you to withdraw from people and not let anybody see you because you had a hurt in the past. Some people know how to get into relationships, but they don't know how to keep relationships. Some people know how to start being friends with somebody, but they don't know how to carry on in a relationship because they're thinking, I can't let this person see all of me or they might hurt me. They might abandon me like Dad did. They might do this and cause me to feel pain. And what you do is you withdraw. And when I withdraw, I hide from God as well. It, though you can't hide from God, you kind of pull back to where God wants to help you and heal you. But when you let the hurt just get buried on the inside and you don't let him have it, you hide in the corner and stay lacking in healing and lacking in help because you're afraid to be exposed before God. All of us have some type of withered hand tonight, I believe. All of us have things that we're ashamed of. I, I know for me, I'll, I'll tell you all what one of my weaknesses is. I get really, really bad social anxiety. Really bad. Like you put me in a group of five people that I don't know well, just talking at a table, just normal. And I'll clam up and get real nervous. Does anybody get like that here? I know I do. Mm -hmm. But it's like there's something that comes over you and you just think, I'm not smart enough to speak. I, I, I don't have anything to say. I, I don't know what, what to do in this situation. And, and that's mine. But your, yours might be you can't stop talking. Yours might be that you're, you're mean when you don't have to be mean. You can say things in a nicer way. All of us have these <laughs> in front like my wife. She's really bold. She, every time I want to have a pity party, Amber don't want to be a part of it. And I haven't quite figured it out yet. <laughs> I'll be like, nobody likes me. People like you, you just need to straighten up and shut up. <laughs> but I can get her back, and sometimes she gets scared about the piano. And I say, well, you do just fine. Just stop worrying about yourself and just let the Lord use yeah. you. <laughs> but we all have things in our life that God wants us to give to Him, hurts from the past, emo emotional scars, things that we think about ourselves. One thing that I really believe that people struggle with here at Marion Church of God specifically is low self-esteem. I, I mean, I've seen that over the years met a lot of people here that just don't believe in themselves. And I want you to know tonight, God believes in you. God believes in this church. It's sitting here tonight because God believes in us. If you're sitting in this room, I think it's a clear indication to me that God's got something for us to do, and He believes we're the right people for the job. Amen. He believes that we can accomplish something. Even in the midst of our weaknesses and our imperfections, God says, if you will lean into me, I will show you great things, and I will do great things through you. But you've got to take that thing and stretch it out to Jesus. Whatever it may be, you got to reach out and say, this is what it looks like, Jesus, and I'm ashamed of it, and I don't know why I feel this way, I don't know why I still struggle with this after 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, but here I am, Jesus, and I'm stretching out to you because I believe just like the man with the withered hand in the Bible, if I will stretch this thing out to you, you'll make it whole again, Jesus. And it could be anything, anything in your life tonight. But I, I still believe that I serve a Jesus who can heal your infirmity today, whatever it may be. You see, a withered heart or a, a hurting spirit is much worse than a withered hand. Yeah, this man had a physical manifestation, but if you don't get it right in here and get it right in here, it don't matter if you have everything together on the outside, it's still going to be a mess and broken. So there is a, a man that I often listen to just to get some encouragement from. His name is Nick Vujicic. Has anybody ever heard of Nick Vujicic? Mm -hmm. He has no arms and he has no legs, but he is full of God. And I got to thinking as I was preparing for this message, man, a lot of us have these withering conditions on the inside. 
And I look at Nick and I'm thinking, boy, he looks happy. Boy, he looks full of joy. Man, he's preaching the word. He's doing God's will. He can't drive himself in a car with his arms. He can't get up and walk out of this church and walk down the steps like you and I can. He has got some disabilities that you would think would just totally cripple him. He can't grab a spoon and get something to eat and scoop it in his mouth. He has no arms. But as I watch Nick, there's one statement that he makes in one of his books that I read called Life Without Limits. And he says, attitude is altitude. Your attitude Amen. is altitude. If you want to learn to see your life at a different perspective, the first thing you've got to start with is your attitude. And attitude is something that you make a choice about every day. I know sometimes we say, I woke up on the wrong side of the bed. No, you chose a bad attitude this morning. You can't wake up on the wrong side of the bed because there's no such thing as the wrong side of the bed. You try sleeping the night. Reverse. I bet you you can sleep just fine. Just move your pillow down there and flip the sheets around. I bet once you close your eyes, you wouldn't know you were flipped. Unless you just wore your bed down in the middle and maybe it's uncomfortable that way. <laughs> but he says attitude is altitude. So what I'm asking you and asking me to do in relation to that is when I get up in the morning, I have a choice to make about what kind of attitude I'm going to choose. And there's one great advantage that we have over the whole world. We have Jesus in our lives. The Holy Spirit lives within us. We've got the hope of salvation. We've got the joy of God. We've got the presence of God in our lives. So though you may not have everything together in your life, though you may have issues, you've got one good thing going, and that's you're on your way to heaven. You're saved by the blood of the Lamb. You're forgiven by the Almighty God. His forgiveness is more important than anyone else's forgiveness. But as I get up and I embrace an attitude of thankfulness to God, I start seeing life from a higher perspective. And I tell you what, once I get up here, everything down here looks a lot smaller. Think about flying in an airplane. You can see great mighty structures that when you're down here seem to be much bigger than you. But even those giant mountains, when you get a little perspective, they just look like little hills. They look like nothing. But it requires you to start the day with a better attitude than most of us choose most days. So one thing I like about Nick, you know, he wondered at one point in his life, i got no arms and legs. Will I ever get married? Will I ever have a family? And I, I looked him up here yesterday. He's got a wife. He's got like three or four kids. He, he's got all kinds of things going for him, but it's because he chose to use what God has given him rather than think about what he doesn't have. And it's going to be a beautiful sight to see him walking in heaven with arms and legs and being able to walk and leap and jump and praise the Lord. It's going to be a wonderful sight. Maybe that disability or that thing that eats at you, maybe you should start thinking, praise God. He's going to use me to spike that. But there's going to be a day when I get to heaven that I don't ever have to think about that thing again. Because it's all going to be wiped away and washed away. And that's through our Lord Jesus Christ. So I want to get back to our good friend Peter here tonight. So he walks on the water, then he sinks. And then Jesus reaches out his hand and stretches it out and grabs him up and saves him. And I can't find any other scriptures in the Bible where it says Jesus ever let go after he stretched his hand out and grabbed Peter. Once he grabbed him, I believe he never, ever let go. So it says in Luke chapter 22, verse 31 and 32, this is a scripture that Jesus is speaking to Peter. And it says, the Lord said, Simon, Simon. Behold, Satan has desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith will not fail. And when you are converted, I want you to strengthen your brethren. So Jesus is, is talking to Peter in that moment, and he's saying, Peter, you're going to go through a trial that is going to be tough because the 
devil desires to sift you as wheat. But I need you to know one thing, Peter. I have prayed for you that your faith will not fail. Did it look like Peter's faith failed when he was denying that he knew Jesus before the little girl out by the fire? It kind of looked like it to me, didn't it to you? Did it look like Peter's faith failed when he denied Jesus two other times? He denied him three times before the cock crowed twice is what it says. And so Jesus said, I have prayed for you that your faith will not fail. And it says that when Peter remembered what Jesus says, he ran away and wept bitterly. And then we get to this next point in Peter's life. And he says, I'm going fishing, guys. And they all go on the boat and go fishing with him. And they go out and they toil and they toil. And then this guy on the shore says, hey, guys, why don't you cast your net on the other side? And they did, and they couldn't bring in all the fish for how many fish they had. And John said to Peter, Peter, that's got to be Jesus. Peter didn't pull the fish into the boat. What did he do? He pulled off his garments and he jumped into the water going after Jesus. You see, in this first moment of his life, he's sinking, crying, Lord, save me. But in this next moment, he's saying, I've got to go to the one who I know has forgiven me. Because if he's here, that means he's not done with me. It means he's not finished with me. And Jesus speaks to Peter in that time there. And he says, Peter, do you really love me? He says, Lord, you know I love you. He says, feed my sheep. And then he goes again and he says, Peter, do you love me? He says, God, you know I love you. He says, feed my lambs. And then he does it one more time. Peter, do you really love me? He's kind of he's kind of bringing full circle. Peter denied him three times. Now he's giving him another opportunity to say, Lord, I love you and I'm sorry for what I've done, but I'm going to be here for you, Lord. I love you. And it's funny, there is one point in those scriptures that uh, he basically says, Peter, you're going to die a pretty brutal death. And Peter says, well, what about John? What about him? And he says, what's it to you what I do with him? <laughs> this, is, this is your plan. That's the first thing you all need to stop doing is thinking about somebody else's plan. God has a plan for you specifically. So I'm going to close with uh, this tonight. Amber, if you want to come play for us on the piano tonight. I'm going to go to Acts chapter 3. This is a, another encounter that Peter had, him and John together. Acts chapter 3, verse 1 through 8. Just trying to bring you full circle into looking at the life of Peter and seeing how Jesus reached out to him and how Peter reached back out to Jesus. Now it says in chapter 3, Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. It's 3 p.m. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful. Man, you're laying at a gate called Beautiful, and you're lame from your mother's womb. To ask alms of them that entered into the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, Asked for alms, for money. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, look on us. I want you to know in that moment, Peter's having tunnel vision and God's speaking to him as he's looking at this man. And he gave a heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, silver and gold have I known. But such as I have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand. That's a picture of Peter reaching down. You know, Jesus reached down and, and he picked up Peter. But after Jesus reaches down and picks you up, then he says, all right, you go out and you pick up others. But it says, as he took him by the right hand, he lifted him up. And immediately his feet and his ankle bones received strength. And he leapt up and stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. I need to tell you tonight that if you've got an infirmity, 
God wants to heal it. If you've got something in your heart that scars you and keeps you from really giving your heart and opening yourself up to people, God wants to heal it. But He's going to heal you so that you can be that hand that reaches down and says, Here, let me take you to Jesus. Let me show you somebody who can set you free. Let me bring you to somebody that can make those drugs not so powerful to you anymore. Let me show you someone that will make all that stuff that you thought was more important with God just wash away. There is one that is greater and mightier and awesomer than any kind of drug you can take, any kind of bottle you can drink from, any kind of bit of money you can get on this earth. There is one greater and more powerful and more loving and more kind, and it's Jesus, our Lord and Savior. And as we share the gospel with others, what we're doing is we're saying, He's given me so much, let me bring you to Him. Let me take you to Him. Let me show you how good my God is. I was driving to work yesterday and I was just thinking about the Lord. You know how some moments you get a revelation and it's not some profound new thing that you learn. It's just a revelation of something simple that God shows you. So as I'm driving to work, it's like this just kept coming over my heart. God really cares about you know, I've heard all my life, Jesus loves you, Jesus loves you, Jesus loves you. But I want to say to you guys tonight, Jesus also cares about you. He cares what you're going through. He cares where you are in your life. He cares when you're hurting. He cares when you're struggling. He really cares. That's why He sent His Holy Spirit to come and minister to us. That's why He gave us His Word. That's why He pours out His love throughout creation. To show you just how much he cares. So tonight while Amber plays on the piano, I just want to invite you if you're able and willing to come to the altar. And if you've got something on the inside that keeps you withered, that keeps you withdrawn, that affects you in your commitment to God, I just want you to lay it out before him tonight and give it to him. And I believe that as you stretch toward God, he will stretch toward you. Just go. 
Can we just lift our hands just for a second? Lord, we just want you. Lord, we need you in our life. We need you in our life, Jesus. We want you to transform us, God. We want you to shake us up, God. Shake all the stuff we don't need out of our lives, God. We just want you, Lord. We love you. We know you're <clears throat> nothing better than you. And we know that here in this room tonight, God. We just want you. God, help us by your Holy Spirit, by your grace, to draw near to you. To come closer to you, God. To, to come deeper in our walks with you. Help us, God, to become more committed people in the house here tonight. We just want you, Jesus. We want to please you. We want to honor you, Lord. We want to hear you say, well done, my good and faithful servant. We love you, Lord. And I just pray for your people here tonight, Father. <coughs> Watch out for them, God. Protect them and keep them safe, Lord. Guard their minds, Lord. Help them to remember that they have the mind of you, Jesus. Help them to remember, Holy Spirit, that greater <coughs> is he that is in them than spirit of antichrist in the world. Help us to remember, God, that you have the final say. You have the last laugh. You win the battle, Lord. Help us to remember that, God, you are greater than any struggle or temptation that we face, God. Help us to have tunnel vision to keep our eyes fixed on you, Lord. God, we love you. We thank you for all you do for us. Lord, we continue to lift up all those who still aren't here tonight that are sick, dealing with things in their lives, Lord, we just ask you to help them right where they are. We ask you to bring our family back, back into the church, God. We ask you to heal our body and touch our body, God, that all of our family here at Marion would be back in the house of God, Lord. We love you. We appreciate you, Father. We pray these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.